Welcome back. In the previous video, we discussed how to form seabed patterns. In this video, we'll talk about what information we can extract from seabed patterns. There is a wealth of information in seabed. For example, you can estimate the sample thickness, you can measure the lattice strain, you can also determine the point group of your crystal, you can determine the chirality of the specimen, and in some special cases, you can also study the structure factor and charge density. In this video, we'll only focus on the thickness measurement and the lattice strain measurement. Before jumping to the details of thickness measurement, let's compare two scenarios. The first is parallel beam diffraction, but with a bent crystal. The local lattice plane directions are different from one place to another. This will lead to bright and dark fringes called bending contours. You will learn more about bending contours in one of the future videos. Now, let's look at the second scenario. The specimen is flat, so all the lattice planes are parallel to each other, but the electron beam is converged, coming into the specimen at different angles. This will be analogous to the first case, where the electron beam is parallel, but the specimen is bent. In the first case, we mentioned there will be bright and dark fringes. Similarly, in the second case, we also expect to see bright and dark fringes. And this is exactly what you see in the seabed pattern on the right. There is a quick note on this. In order to see the bright and dark fringes, the specimen has to be fairly thick, and the electron beam undergoes dynamical diffraction. To measure the thickness of your TEM foil, you need to tilt the specimen to a two-beam condition. This is your direct beam disk, and this is the diffracted beam disk. Again, you can see those bright, dark, bright, dark fringes inside the disks. On the left is a schematic of what you see. To calculate the thickness of your specimen, you need to locate the center line of the diffracted disk. Then, you locate the first dark fringe you see. The distance between the center line and the first dark fringe is called that delta theta 1. Repeating the same process, now let's locate the second dark fringe. And the distance between the center line and the second dark fringe is called that delta theta 2. You can further repeat the process to get delta theta 3, delta theta 4, etc. Then how can we quantify delta theta 1 and delta theta 2? In order to see diffraction spots or diffraction disks, the electron have to undergo Bragg diffraction. Therefore, the distance between the direct beam and the diffracted beam will be 2 theta b. Assuming you have acquired the diffraction pattern on the film, you can just use a ruler to measure the distance of 2 theta b in millimeters. You can also easily measure the delta theta 1, delta theta 2 in millimeters. Now, let's do the thickness estimation. We will introduce a new parameter called Si. Si is a function of lambda, delta theta i, theta b, and d. Lambda is the wavelength of your electron beam, which is determined by the acceleration voltage. Delta theta i and the theta b are the values you can measure using a ruler on the film. d is the interplanar spacing. In this case, it's the interplanar spacing of two OO planes. Then we can write down another equation. We have Si square over Nk square plus 1 over Ksi G square Nk square equals to 1 over T square. Si has been defined by the equation above. Nk are the numbers of your choice. We'll come back to that soon. Ksi G is the extinction distance of that specific G vector. T is the specimen thickness. This equation looks quite complicated. However, if we treat Si square over Nk square, as y and 1 over nk square as x, they will form a linear relationship. The slope of the line is minus 1 over psi square, and the intercept on the y axis is 1 over t square. What this tells us is if we put s1, s2, and s3 into this equation, they should form a straight line. Coming back to nk, coming back to nk, for nk, if we select three s values, we can assign nk as 1, 2, and 3 first. If it does form a straight line, then we can calculate the t value, the specimen thickness, straight away. 
if it does not form a straight line, then we'll assign nk as 2, 3, and 4. We'll repeat the process until the three s values will form a straight line. Once the straight line is formed, the t value can be identified and you will know the foil thickness. Next, we'll discuss the strain measurement using seabed. This part focuses more on introducing you some new concepts rather than teaching you how to quantify strain using seabed. I hope you still remember the figure on the left from the EvoSphere video. We will see diffraction when the EvoSphere intersects with the reciprocal lattice points in TM foil, those are rare rods. In most of the cases, we see the diffraction spots from the EvoSphere intersecting with the first layer of the reciprocal lattice points. These diffraction spots are caught in the zero order Lowy zone. The EvoSphere can also interact with the reciprocal lattice point on the second and the third layers. They will also form diffraction spots, and these spots are in the first order Lowy zone and the second order Lowy zone. In diffraction pattern, for the zero order Lowy zone, you see a patch of patterns. In higher order Lowy zones, you see rings of patterns. In CBAT, because the electron beam is converged, the electron beam direction is not a single value that will give us a range. The evil sphere now is more like an evil belt. As long as the evil belt intersects with the reciprocal lattice points, the diffraction patterns will show up. As a result, diffraction spots in higher order Lowry zones can be more easily excited in seabed. Here, we have discussed the zero order Lowry zone and the higher order Lowry zones. Next, we're going to introduce you a new concept called zone lines. Before going into zone lines, let's look at one concept we're already familiar with, Kikuchi lines. To produce Kikuchi lines, you have the electron beam coming straight down, then it first undergoes inelastic scattering. These electrons will go in all random directions, and after that it undergoes the Bragg diffraction to give you the Kikuchi lines. In seabed, the electron beam converges, so it comes down in a wide range of directions. If the convergence angle is greater than the Bragg angle, then some of the electron beam within this cone will undergo Bragg diffraction, giving you Kikuchi lines. In this case, there's no need for the electron beam to undergo inelastic diffraction first, so those Kikuchi lines are also called zone lines. Now, we can look at how to relate the Kikuchi lines to the strain of the material. If the material is elastically strained, then the lattice spacing will change. If the lattice spacing changes, then the width of the Kikuchi band or the distance between the two Kikuchi lines will change. The same idea applies to the Lowy zone lines. If we compare the distance of the Kikuchi lines or the Lowy zone lines of the strained area, to the unstrained area, we can quantify the strain. When quantifying the strain, it's better to use the higher order Lowry zone lines rather than the zero order Lowry zone lines. Then, what are the higher order Lowry zone lines and what are the zero order Lowry zone lines? The zero order Lowry zone lines are very similar to the conventional Kikuchi lines. These are few examples. They go through multiple diffraction spots or diffraction disks. The higher order Lowry zone lines are the ones within each disk. Looking at the example on the right, the blue dashed lines are the zero order Lowry zone lines. The more closely spaced ones are the higher Lowry zone lines. By comparing the position of the higher order Lowry zone lines to the simulated data, it will tell you the elastic strain stored in the material. You may wonder why using the higher order Lowry zone lines instead of the zero order Lowry zone lines to determine the strain in the specimen. This is because higher order Lowry zone lines uses a much larger G vector, so it's very sensitive to the strain in the material. Even very small elastic strains can be better captured. If you are interested in using CBAT to calculate strain stored in your specimen, you can visit Professor Jiaming Zhuo's website. Professor Zhuo is a faculty at UIUC and an expert in CBAT and strain mapping. On his research website, you can find softwares developed by him and his group to calculate strain from CBAT patterns.
This is the last video of the diffraction part of this course. Starting from next video, we'll start discussing the imaging part of TEM 